Welcome to Ahead of the Game, a podcast brought to you by the Digital Marketing Institute. This episode is a big Q&A where we explore an area of marketing through a leading industry expert. I'm your host, Will Francis, and today I'll be talking to Carl Malin, an analyst, expert and educator who's been in digital for almost two decades, working with brands like Aer Lingus, Coca-Cola, Board Beer and many more. He's the DMI's go-to expert on all things e-commerce. And so today I'll be asking him all about the rise of social commerce and how we can get started with our businesses. Carl, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Will. How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. So yeah, social commerce, it does seem to be uh, something that's been on the horizon or it's been present for a very long time. But it's um, I feel like people are taking it a lot more seriously now. Is that just because... E-commerce has really exploded uh, in the recent year or so because of the pandemic, do you think? It predated the pandemic a little bit. Like, obviously, you know, within the pandemic, we have seen a massive acceleration of online sales activity, but it really kind of predated it to like even far back, far back to 2017, 18, where we started to see kind of some interesting social commerce campaigns and strategies emerging that really worked and that was the the key thing that made everyone notice is that it really really worked you know um and that's this is this is where kind of i got most interested into it because i come from search i come from search which is predominantly a transactional based channel you know you're driving sales you're driving revenue all that stuff and social media was this other animal and it didn't seem to do that so 2017 and 18, we started seeing social doing things that had been traditionally, you know, the realm of search in terms of significant sales. And that's that's kind of it's very short, but, you know, kind of meteoric history is that we are seeing something really something different happening now. And we are talking about basically being able to buy stuff whilst you're in a social platform without leaving that platform, right? Just to kind of uh, clarify what we mean. Yeah. So just to kind of, I suppose, give the nuances of social commerce, it's not necessarily clicking a Facebook ad and then going off to a website and buying. It's all contained within one ecosystem. So you click an ad on Facebook and you go to a Facebook shop and then you can pick that item, add it to your cart, and um, you can buy that item all within the Facebook interface. Also, there's load like there's other platforms that allow you to do this too. But that's basically it. You don't have to go anywhere, and it's predominantly mobile because these apps have you know additional functionality that allow you to add and check out and pay, and everything's integrated. It's all like that Amazon one click, where you don't need to do a bunch of stuff to actually buy it. That's a good point, actually. It is is predominantly mobile, isn't it? And I suppose that that could have only happened because people became, in general, more comfortable with buying on mobile, you know, in the last few years. Yeah, and again, without kind of harking back to the pandemic too much either, like uh, in my classes that I teach, I ask my students, do you buy more on your phone this year than last year? And all of them, say yes in every single age group so we kind of e-commerce came to our lives as part of a desktop computer and we're used to doing that taking out the credit card popping it in making sure everything's correct and then going ahead and buying because we fear that we'll somehow make a mistake on our phone and, and be charged money but like that's really unlikely because all that will happen is you will have entered an incorrect credit card number or something so we trust mobile more now the functionality of phones, the technology of phones allows us to do a lot more within an app. They're pretty powerful devices. So you will find that a lot of your standard social apps do have this layer of functionality that's invisible to the average user that allows for things like e-commerce transactions to take place. So you don't have to go anywhere. You can just buy it there and then. Super easy. And that's that's the real draw of social commerce. There's fewer clicks and more sales. So that's great for e-commerce shops. It's handy for users. How does it benefit the platforms? Why are they driving this forward? They get ad revenue out of it. So there's there's a number of things. Um, 
they get ad revenue first of all because you'll be promoting your products on the different platforms um they haven't gone down the route of taking a cut of the transaction fees but you could see that you know um you could see that happening that if people are transacting using the different checkouts that they take a cut and they'll they'll kind of benefit from that but really it's it's ad fees. It's there. It's advertising. Yeah, that's that's the thing. It's you can you can advertise here because it's free to have a shop, isn't it? It's free to have a, a shop and a catalog of products in these social platforms. But of course, once you've got it, you realise no one's looking, no one can see, and so uh, yeah, you're very much guided towards um, using that product catalog as a basis for ads. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's another way that uh, the platforms can drive ad revenue for sure. Okay, so social commerce, it's essentially a free tool to um, showcase your products and social platforms. And then you can optionally pay to advertise those products um, in a targeted way. So we, we know what it is. So what type of products and brands do you think work best with social commerce? Yeah, um, it's evolving. So at the moment, we do find that brands with low costs like it like it you know like a like a low purchase price will work better on social because we do find that it, it, there's an impulse level that you see something on instagram and you're a little bit you know astounded by it and you think it's really great and fascinated and you might go ahead and purchase it but if it's like five thousand dollars you might not you know but if it's like 250 dollars you might you know so we do find that within the threshold of impulse purchases from a particular category that works quite well so you won't as i say buy a land rover but you might buy a ten dollar t-shirt yes and i mean personally you know i've uh, employed social commerce tools for for my own work for my business selling training courses the the frustration is you can only uh in general only use it for physical products you know you can't list services um and sort of software um, it has to be for something that is a physical product. That's certainly the, fa- the case on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and also, of course, ban, you know, sort of like uh, prohibited products in any way, like firearms and stuff. Um, so uh, it, that's worth mentioning. You know, it, it, it that's another reason why I think it really tends towards fashion, particularly. Um, and, you know, then all the kind of gift type stuff like homewares and toys and things like that. What sort of products do particularly well? Are we talking, is it the sort of 5 and $10 products or are, are there any brands with several hundred dollar or thousand dollar products on there? Yeah, no, there, there definitely, definitely are. And there's some really interesting brands that have done some, some interesting things using social commerce techniques like when, now it's a little bit old, but back in 2018 when Nike launched their like Air Jordan range It was all done on Snapchat. So it was basically an event where people went to this event and at the event you could scan marketing codes and QR codes and all that stuff that would open a like a Snapchat window where you're able to purchase that product within the Snapchat window itself. When you're at that event, when you were at that event or people who were at that event got their product delivered to them by 10.30 that night. You know, it was a big event thing where it's like, amazing delivery you know integrated with phones integrated with augmented reality and all of this so there is some like we do find a lot of brands do event-based stuff when it's higher aov when it's higher average order value have higher prices and they'll do an event around the thing um, and that can encourage people to be a little bit more giddy a little bit more excited about buying a product like so um so like there's other there's other brands like there's that Bole brand, uh, sunglasses brand that again at an event, um, they did like like you could scan a QR code and then it would open like a certain type of Pinterest integration that allowed you to take your photographs for Pinterest through the different lens that you would potentially see through these sunglasses. So you know there's when you want to go a little and they're expensive products that's what i mean so when you want to go a little bit more expensive we do find that a standard product feed integration for example or a standard facebook ad probably is not going to cut it 
you know so you can sell big on social um but it generally has to be accompanied by some kind of creative campaign for it to be effective otherwise people are just going that's that's too expensive i'm, I'm not taking the risk yeah. here you know and they'll they'll revert back to searching and and this type of uh purchase well patterns. that's the thing i mean i'm just thinking of the how this fits into like you know the funnel and all, all the different digital channels all play a role in that i mean the common thing that you know the common thing that i find with clients and, and my own stuff really is social ads and uh, other types of advertising do a lot of the warming up a lot of moving people through the funnel and it can sometimes look like search is driving all the purchases because when people actually go do you know what i keep seeing ads for that dress i really want i'm just going to go and get it and that's when they search they google it and they go and buy it and so it looks in the reports as if search is driving all the purchases right but what's actually happening is it's like a relay race where search is just the last runner crossing the finish line with the baton and you know you need to give all the other uh, runners in the team credit like social media and all the other places that they've been exposed to the idea of that product and move down the funnel so i suppose that one of the good things about social commerce is it uh, you can have like lots, you know, lots of different types of messaging advertising around a product that makes people aware of it, makes people consider it. But then you can also go for the jugular with those um, now it's time to buy it type ad campaigns. Right. And you can serve the whole funnel in one place. So that's the thing. It's kind of depending on your KPIs for and your objectives for social commerce and um, you can decide to have a predominant assisted strategy or a closing strategy so before we tend to fa- before we tended to find that social media was a brand building creative engagement channel that you know and um, certainly did something but we didn't know what what social commerce and we didn't know what and then obviously search did kind of sweep up all the the credit for that so it's social commerce is doing is it's allowing social media to assist sales but also allowing social media to prove itself as a closing channel too so you're kind of getting the best of both worlds because when you think about search if there's no one searching for your product there's no one buying your product so search needs something to fill that pipeline whereas with social because it starts off as an outbound activity you show an ad you show a product to someone it kind of captures people imagine people's imagination and then yes they might ruminate and go off and search or they might you know engage with the brand a little bit more and buy there and then within that ecosystem so social commerce has the best of those inbound and outbound actions that it can drive awareness and it can drive sales so it's 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 interesting in that regard um but yeah, I do know what you mean with search. Like, I, I, as a, me, someone who is a search manager, I certainly do love social media for making all my campaigns look amazing. You know, because, um, because yeah, you do a big campaign on social and then the search goes up and you're like, oh yeah, of course, my search stuff. But the reality is that, you know, that was initiated by a social campaign. Now, that doesn't mean that social commerce is a pure closing channel. It is very much an assisting channel too. So we'll what do you mean by see... an assisting channel? Okay, so what I mean by an assisting channel is we have channels that close the sale or we have channels that assist the sale. Hmm. A channel that closes the sale will be something like search or email. Typically hmm. the, the last channel that someone uses before they buy. An assisting channel is something that helped them become aware or get ready to, you know, kind of consider a product. Move them towards it move them towards move them towards a uh, conversion so um so social media like or social commerce could be you know seen as both as an assisting and a closing channel so you know um when you see a product in your newsfeed yes you can buy it or you can choose not to buy it and buy it when you're ready via the channel that you prefer you know um search can't generate any customer intent it just doesn't really do that it is the well, no, benefactor have to be searching it is the benefactor of customer intent and what people are searching for you know so um search management is all about visibility and managing numbers to make sure your cpa is 
kind of on target and different things where social commerce can start and finish its own journey which is very interesting well mm -hmm. that's it you yeah you mentioned cost per acquisition cpa i'll come back to that in a sec because i want to ask you about how social commerce can affect that i mean i i think that for me one thing i really like about social commerce is you know i i mean i've been trying to tell people for years i think now by now that social media is two different things it's organic and it's paid and they work very differently and the beauty about paid is that it leaves the organic to do what organic does best and that is just engage people um, help deepen their passion be there for them be basically useful or entertaining like drop valuable content into their feed and not try and sell to them not promote at them not ask for anything back right that's that's how organic should work and then paid is where you can do all that hard sell um, and you can because you can target people at very specific points in their life cycle in the funnel. You can do remarketing, etc. I think social commerce just extends that. And hope what I'm hoping is that as it sort of burgeons that people will um, recognize that marketers will recognize that and let let, you know, social ads and social commerce do the selling and allow themselves to be more creative and engaging in organic and not try and just ram promotional messages down people's throats in those organic channels because by doing that you just tell the algorithm to make you invisible that's that's essentially what you do when you promote in your organic content right so i hope i hope it brings a bit of a clarification to how to use social channels as a marketer yeah, definitely. I mean, like there's a couple of challenges that we all face with social media. And one of them is your Google Analytics, for example. You look in Google Analytics and you go, social media is not doing any sales. Let's mm. cut social. You know, um, the basic rule of advertising and any advertising that's outbound where you're essentially interrupting someone's day, their, their social feed or whatever, is you need to give them something in return for their attention. So it has to be, as you would say, um, something creative, something interesting, something valuable, something rewarding, because you're interrupting whatever it is they're doing. So in return for their attention, you have to give them something that's, you know, at least valuable to them, whether it's a joke or something that's just interesting. And I think, you know, that's what organic does need to do. Social commerce adds this whole extra layer of technology to the social media world in terms of checkouts and shops and stores and product feeds and all that stuff that doesn't really feature as heavily in the non-commercial world, in the organic brand building world. So, you know, you do approach it totally different because one is kind of very tech and um, paid ads and indeed conversion focused. And the other one is like old school advertising, building a brand, engaging with your customers, showing them your values that kind of thing, you know, and um, to approach them both the same would be would be a poor use of time, shall we say. No, I think, I think it's great. And I think it's, I think it's more clarification for the user as well, because, you know, you, you, you present your products in a very clearly shop-like way um, rather than trying to kind of, you know, rather than trying to kind of weave products into rewarding, valuable content. Um, it sort of frees you up to say, well, you know, we can just present products and they they are clearly, the user is in no doubt, there's a price next to them, you know, it's our shop, it's this is the stuff we sell, we can be open and explicit about that. Again, freeing up organic to do what it does best. So um, I think it's, I think it's a good, definitely a good thing that's coming. So I suppose, you know, and, um, and sorry, just to come back to you, did mention CPA, I'm curious, do you know any, do you've got, do you have any data on that like is it improving cost per acquisition yeah so that's the thing so cpa is when done in conjunction with social commerce activities do work quite well now i just want to qualify that that they're blended cpas they're cpas that you kind of start doing things like looking at increases in brand search and that will feature into a cpa around social media or something so it's um it's not it's not direct CPA. It's not that, you know, clear cut search CPA, the last click CPA. It's it's more of a blended approach. You mean where you look at you're looking at more in a more overall combined cost of your marketing versus your yeah. amount of conversions. Right. So overall there seems to be an improvement, like a reduction in the cost per acquisition, the cost for driving a sale, 
for brands who employ social commerce. That's what, that's what you're saying. Definitely, because yeah. like, think about it. Like we had sales channels. So search is your sales channel. Now we have these other channels that are a little bit cheaper than search, like social, that are also doing some incremental sales along the lines too. So overall, you can grow your business and expand and scale into other channels that weren't typically selling before that are now able to sell. And overall, you know, the, your kind of your baseline CPA will go down. Your sales will go yeah. up. It sounds great. I love it. I, I, I love the sound of that. So is it, is it, is it easy to get, you know, for, for our listeners will now be thinking, this is fantastic. How do I get it started? Yeah, well, there's the three first three things you need is social media profile. So choose your ideal social profile based on your personas. So whichever channels your customers use. You need an e-commerce site because we're selling socially. Um, it's better to have an e-commerce site. You can have a pure online um, social media house store, but you're better off having like an e-com site as well. So you do um, have to have a website. You can't do this without a website. You right. can. You can absolutely do this without yeah. a website. Um, it's just you're limiting yourself to an entire e-commerce strategy based through social commerce. Whereas, you know, like, uh, like as a digital marketer, I'd never recommend anyone just focus in on one channel. So to do social, like just for a business to do, like you can do social commerce with nothing more than a, f a Facebook profile, you know, but you're limiting yourself in terms of things like organic search and email and paid search and all those other channels that kind of come in. So, you know, it's just a bit of risk associated with that, but you certainly can do it. I just think that it would probably be better to be kind of supported by a website yeah as if well. only a base a very basic one also re remarketing i suppose there's, there are remarketing opportunities and like you say cross channel um remarketing opportunities between search social display etc right okay so you need a social profile you do ideally need a, a website an e-commerce website what else and then a product right, feed. Okay. that's the technical bit that sounds like the tricky bit it does sound a tricky, but they've got a Dumbo version, which is really great. That allowed me to do it very easily. Um, so they've got this fairly straightforward version where in what's called something like Facebook Commerce Manager. So Facebook Commerce Manager is your starting point. You have your profile, you go to Facebook Commerce Manager, and there you can upload products to what's called a product catalog. If you've got like three products or four products, say you're only like a small food retailer or something, you've only got a couple of products, you can just input them. You can literally just input them. You write their names, you write the price. Yeah, you, you don't need any around. fancy sort of feed and syncing or anything no, like that. No, no yeah. feeds or anything like that. Now, if you're a larger website, if you're like a like, like a Little Woods or an ASOS or something that has like, like thousands and thousands of SKUs, you do want to have a bit more of a automated approach that's where you use something like a product feed or a data feed um which sounds very very techy but it's just a spreadsheet um so and i know we're in an audio medium right now but i might as well explain how you do it if, if do, you'll indulge please. me um so fairly straightforward you have your e-commerce store you export your e-commerce store to a spreadsheet now you've got like all of your products and your images and your links and your prices in a spreadsheet. All Facebook wants is the columns of those spreadsheets named in a certain way. So just you just need to find out and you can just do a Google search for Facebook data feed column names and just rename your columns of your exported spreadsheet from your e-commerce store. Yeah, that. and I also it's worth mentioning that if you're on Shopify or if you're using WooCommerce, um, I know in WooCommerce there is a plugin. There's an extra kind of extension to WooCommerce you could get that that, that yeah. syncs it, and that's quite useful because then obviously you can you know automatically syncs new products, um, out of stock products, um, deleted products, and that kind of thing. Yeah, so the plugins are like the best, best of all. You know, um, some websites don't have plugins. That's why, like, because as a kind of yeah. catch all would definitely kind of mention the oh, spreadsheet. Yeah. But my preference is always plugins because essentially what happens is if a price changes on your website, it's updated automatically in the shop on Facebook. Um, 
and it's super super easy like there's zero maintenance on it once you set it up once you set up that plugin it's a direct communication between whatever you change on your website updates in your facebook store so you've only one thing to manage and that's your site and then everything else, whether it's Facebook shopping, Instagram shopping, Pinterest, any of the other ones will just update automatically. So does all the heavy lifting for also you. Also Google as well, Google Merchant Center. Yeah. And Google yeah. too, yeah. Hello, a quick reminder from me that if you're enjoying our podcast series, why not become a member of the DMI so that you can enjoy loads more content from webinars and case studies to toolkits and more real life insights from the world of digital marketing. Head to digitalmarketinginstitute.com forward slash ahead of the game to sign up for free. Now back to the podcast. Um, right, so that's the basics of making sure your products are present in the social platform you want to operate in. Uh, what are the key platforms? We, you know, the Instagram gets a lot of the limelight here. Um, where else can we showcase our products? So we can obviously integrate with Facebook as part of the Instagram, Facebook ecosystem, Pinterest too. Um, Snapchat does little bits of stuff in certain markets. Predominantly, if you want scale, though, it is Instagram. Instagram is really where shopping makes a big difference because it's so visual. We do find a lot of the products that do fit into the kind of social commerce purchase world are fashion based visual products, homewares this kind of stuff. So within a visual medium and a purely visual social channel like Instagram, that's where it does happen. But, you know, other platforms to use, obviously, are, as I said, Pinterest and Facebook over in the east and places like China. We do have like tools like WeChat, where we can do a lot of social selling and um, within that. So world. I get it. It's a simple system. People can buy your stuff in these places, but they're not really having much of a brand experience, you know, that they, they it's very transactional. They click on something, they buy it, and they just trust that it's in the post. So what about kind of customer service and reviews and that kind of extended, you know, ex part of the kind of customer experience? How does and can that play out with social commerce? It's considered part of it as part of the wider strategy. So while we really have been talking about the selling aspect, which is um, setting up your shop, doing your product feed, pushing out, you know, your product either, either via paid ads or hoping that they stumble across your store organically. All of this stuff does need to be supported by trust signals like customer reviews, like, you know, security at checkouts, like all of the things that you would typically look for on an e-commerce site before you buy. Because we don't like buying off sites that ask for our credit card details on not, on a non-HTTPS site or different things like that. So we, we tend to find that customer reviews, about pages, organic posting, these are supporting efforts to kind of push people along the, the funnel within the social, social ecosystem. And the social commerce aspect, I mean, the hard, hard social commerce aspect is just like search in the end it's just there to clean up it's just there to capture that kind of initial intent and provide a simplified experience for the transaction to occur so testimonials are really important as a supporting interaction with um with the consumer so as part of a wider social commerce strategy and maybe i should have qualified this that it's not just set up your store and go there's a number of moving parts that we do have to be mindful of, like, you know, organic posting from your brand, building your values, your trust for your community, all of that stuff, supporting trust signals like customer reviews, security at checkouts, all of those different things make people kind of assured and reassured that they're making the right choice if they are ready to jump for an impulse buy. So um, testimonials would be, would be important as part of that wider social commerce strategy just not necessarily the store functionality yeah i get it um and and i think i think that's the point that's a good point to make that you don't just set up a product feed and start selling you can do i mean there are definitely people who do this from home where if there's a very hot trend like a trend in product like a very specific thing um 
you could you know drop ship that that product so i i e just basically sell it direct from a warehouse in china to the consumer um there there is a place for that but in general you're not going to build a million dollar business off of a product feed there needs to be that stuff around it like you said it's social organic community other channels of um contact with people to make them feel safe and you know and make them aware of you make them like you make them want to do business with you and know a bit about you yeah i suppose after sale stuff is the is the email address and the messaging strategy isn't it and that's where that you know just because it's social commerce uh doesn't mean to say you don't send them an email and have you know quite traditional i would imagine post sale communications with customers right mm -hmm. because that's what works and that's yeah, how we definitely. make people feel mm -hmm. confident and um and also how we yeah contact them in other places so it doesn't just feel like it was just a throwaway one-off um instagram thing email's very reassuring yeah. isn't it like it's a real formal yeah. channel it's like we've got yeah. your order it's now being looked after so even though the transaction did occur on the social platform, an automated email just to kind of say, yeah, look, we have everything in hand. It seems like a, you know, worthwhile formal communication with. You met in the customer. nightclub. You had a great time. You still have to go to church to get married. Something <laughs> like that. I don't. Is that the right analogy? I don't know. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's just <laughs> like, yeah, it, like e-commerce is hard. You, you don't just crack open a shop and start selling and then retire to the Bahamas. There's a lot going on, you know. So, you know, it's it, it, it is definitely a hard slog in, in every it, it is. It is. And and there's no two ways about it. I mean, there's uh, as a bit of further watching. Anybody interested in this should go on YouTube. And um, there's lots of people who've done sort of 48 hour experiments. Like, can I set up a Shopify and, you know, turn around 20 grand in a weekend kind of thing? Um, because I suppose it's become quite, uh, it's entered popular culture, I think, this idea that you can just rock up on Shopify and with the right curated drop shipped products, create a boutique and just start pumping ad money in one at one side in the form of ad spend and pumping out a bit more money on the other end in terms of product revenue and profit. Um, so uh, I suppose that brings on to, you know, promotion, like do, does is this essentially very heavily reliant on social ads in terms of promotional channel or are I there other things is. we can do? I mean, I think it's really heavily relied on social ads because the social ad integrations mean that everything is kind of being managed within this one ecosystem from your shop to your organic page to your paid advertising. The other thing is the dynamic remarketing, you know, where someone has like looked at a particular product either on your website or in your shop and then you keep seeing that product in ads again and again and again. That's a very compelling type of ad proposition to, you know, to businesses. They're like, I'll keep showing people the products that they look at and it's all integrated and Facebook does it for me or Pinterest does it for me, you know, and the kind of the go-to place for a lot of organizations will be let's just pay for a bunch of ads because it's probably going to deliver a decent scale good roi when done correctly and it's easy to do but as you say there are other channels that can certainly support this like you know and whether it's widgets on your own website whether it's you know if you have an app the, there's the emails there's loads of other channels that can support your social social commerce activity the starting point of everything is traffic. So where does the traffic come from? Ads are the easiest one. And then, you know, we, we, we'll need to kind of discover new avenues because otherwise we're just, you know, spending money on, on ads when we can certainly do a little bit of incremental mm -hmm. with uh, organic activity. And of course, a lot of this takes place on Instagram. So presumably influencers play a role. One of my favorites. So influencers, I you know very cynical when it kind of came out because of my advanced age um i was quite cynical when influencers kind of started coming to the fore it's you know all, all these kind of ridiculous things going on and all, and and um and no one really knew what was happening but with social commerce and with affiliate marketing you can give your influencers 
affiliate links, which are trackable links that will show how much traffic they brought to your website and how much revenue is generated from that traffic. You can then have an arrangement, obviously, with that influencer to give them something like a commission for every sale that they make, you know. So rather than influencers just doing a bunch of wacky creative stuff, they are tied to a kind of revenue based payment structure that if they don't sell anything, they don't get their commissions. But the more they sell on our behalf or influence those sales on our behalf, the more um, the more commission we give them. So. It's where affiliate marketing, which is people selling your products in their stores, in their in their websites or whatever. um, And influencers coming together to make it something just a little bit more tangible and less kind of make yuppie, you know, so because because we're trying to sell stuff here. So you don't want to be just hand the 25 grand to an influencer who will maybe put your product in a swimming pool and set it on fire. And then that's it. You know, you want to know that there's actual tangible returns from this. And that's what um, that's what affiliates are kind of doing. Yeah, now. yeah, I get that. We we do. We did an episode on influencer marketing actually a few months ago, went uh, deep into that topic. It's also a topic that's close to my heart, something I've worked a lot in on both sides of the equation, I have to say. And I agree. I mean, I think that um, for me, influencer marketing, there was a lot of hype around it, sort of 12 13 years ago something like that and then it sort of got a really bad name and it was really trashed because of all the kind of you know scandals with bad disclosure with celebrities accidentally pasting the whole email from their agent into the instagram description and stuff like that you know like some real howlers um and and just a general i think jadedness on the part of consumers but i think it's matured and i think it's become useful and and a bit more respected again as as a as a as a channel and and uh and you know i think we've all realized it's not all about trying to get the kardashians talking about your product um mm. it's about getting the right people even if it's someone with 3000 followers if hey if they're the right 3000 followers i want to work with you you know, and so that we've seen the rise of micro, even nano influencers, nano influencers, um, and yeah. the blurred line between customer and influencer, and and all that. So, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can see how that plays into social commerce because essentially, um, you know, it's 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 people showcasing our products, but with the rise of social commerce. They 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 are showcasing actual products that people can act on and buy rather than just an image that is that a product in it you know and it's it's a bit more of a direct sales That's channel in that way isn't it yeah and, um, even on Instagram now as well when an influencer creates a post or anybody creates a post they can mark it as being a brand collaboration and they can tag that brand in a very specific way so we're seeing the formalization of a few things there and clearly. And and I I think it's important to say it's not just a fashion thing because influencer marketing is always thought of like as this real fashion thing. I think any brand, you know, if you're a a science brand or or an engineering brand, there are influencers in your space and you need to to find out who they are and work with them for sure. Yeah, no. So there's been a lot of technology that's allowed um, influencers to really flex their muscles in the sense that it's not just putting up a picture on Instagram and there's no link. And there's a couple of hashtags and hoping for the best. This is a totally different integrated system where, again, you can buy all within the app, you know, so the accountability comes in. And that's really important because there's just influencers asking for exorbitant fees without, you know, delivering in a way that could be measured and justified to your boss when you've asked for half a million euro or something, you know, so I think... I think the accountability with the technological um, advances in social commerce has kind of gone hand in hand with the resurgence of influencers, the credibility of influencers um, across all different industries. It's it just it means we're not being messed around anymore. Yeah, you're right. You know? it, it's, it, there is that credibility and accountability. And that, again, it's it's a, another way that things have become uh, clearer it, it, and, you know, it's both to the user the audience and to brands, it's everything is just more um, out on the table, isn't it? Because products mm-hmm. are tagged as products, and influencer influencers tag the brands they work with in that way, and it's all um, 
I think it all adds up to a more authenticity. That thing that you know all brands and influencers are striving towards is authenticity, and and that's so important. Okay, so uh, just if you wouldn't mind just grabbing your crystal ball for a moment, <laughs> um, what what's in there? What where are we going with this? It it feels to me, I've got to say like there's a long way to go i mean we're still largely just serving up mobile versions of web pages in a handy frame within social apps um and we know i know there's a bit more integration being tested and direct payments and things like that but where where are we going what's on the immediate horizon and where might this end up so my go-to point when it comes to any kind of future gazing is to always look eastward and to see what's happening in places like China and Singapore and Taiwan and these places that have a very mobile audience. So the starting point is it's going mobile. It's going big mobile. The reason is, first of all, again, back to the technology. Computers don't have the same level of functionality as a phone in terms of like real world GPS, 24 seven cameras, all of these different things that phone technology, phone devices actually have. So what we see over in, in the kind of the Eastern markets is integrations of live feeds from influencers or key opinion leaders as they're known over in, in the Chinese markets and stuff. So, you know, we've got these direct sales things. There's all additional functionality to purchase. Um, payment happens within the app. The um, um, there's apps within apps, which is something that fascinates mm, the WeChat me. ecosystem and all that. The we the WeChat ecosystem, the mini program system. So, WeChat is a vast um message one to one messaging app that's based in China that has much more functionality than a standard messaging app. So, you can host your own app within the WeChat ecosystem. So if I have an app for a travel company, for example, I can have my app within, listed within the channels of WeChat and I've all the functionality. I've got ways to engage with WeChat users. I can then text them things. I can send them live streams. I can send them content directly to their phone. They can pay via WePay or WeChat Pay. Um, so the payment is integrated and they can get discounts. Now, this is something that hasn't been leveraged a lot in our markets, and that's discounts and building up credit. It's like your Tesco club card points. It's every time you go back to the mini app, the mini program for my travel company, you get a couple of points and you can redeem those points on purchases and, and holidays and different things like that. If you play a game, I've got a little dice game or something like that in my in my mini program. And if you play a game and you get a certain score, you get points to your club card points, essentially. And you can redeem those on additional. So if you book a flight or something, you can get upgraded to first class and different things like that. So I would put it down to we need to look towards what supermarkets are doing with their customer loyalty programs. And that's what's happening next with social commerce, because it's a tried and tested methodology with shopping carts and collecting points and discounts. You know, it lends itself very easily to the social commerce ecosystem and sphere. So that's the world I think we're heading towards is a fully integrated multi app kind of super location that offers other things like discounting right. and all of that um, and it's going to be all mobile phones. that's really interesting so yeah loyalty and um and sort of cross business loyalty is that what you're talking about so you could accrue these kind of credits across different retailers and they can all be redeemed yeah and they can be redeemed and the other thing is because because it's phone they can be redeemed in store they can be redeemed with QR codes. There's all these other things that you can't do carrying a laptop around the place. It's going to be social commerce with this I don't know, transferable tentacle that goes across all of these different other it's touch It's kind points. of like a loyalty layer or something like that, isn't it? That you could see um, a bit like air miles. 
it's just touching everything, all parts of the brand, offline, online, on your phone, that kind of thing, you know, and simplicity of just having it all there. You pay with Google Pay, you know, whatever. Yeah, it is. That, and that's another thing. How, how how might social commerce integrate with offline? Because of course, again, we see the integration of WeChat with you know QR codes printed out on coffee shop counters and all over the place. How do you think social commerce might integrate with offline here in the future? It could happen based on, say, what's happening with COVID, that a lot of high street stores become um, like where you go to try something but may not necessarily buy it. They're, they're almost like showrooms. So with your social commerce stuff, it's the redemption of points and access that you can then buy that product at a lower rate online if you've scanned it in a shop or, or, or something. So it's all about redemption. It's all about loyalty and repeat purchase. So the thing is, like loyalty points cost nothing. They li- Like for a brand to do a loyalty point, you have to spend, you know, $200 to get five points. You know, five points is nothing to a brand, you know, but to a consumer, they start accruing over time. Um, and they really think they're getting something in return for it. So it's it's a very good methodology to use those offline experiences like the showroom experiences to accrue points to purchase right, them That's online. really interesting. Anything else to look out for on the horizon, do you think? Well, it's interlinked, actually. So the other thing that, you know, it's, it's been around for a very long time is user-generated content. So UGC, user generated content, is when your customers will do something on your behalf because they like you or you've given them something in return. So they've checked in in your in your store. They've gotten some they've gotten some points from your social uh, social commerce program and they write a nice review. They will demonstrate themselves wearing the product, you know, showcasing the product, demonstrating the product. So. Other people can see how it's used. Other people can get that social proof, that social reinforcement. They're building your brand for you in return for it. Yeah, again, that those loyalty points, those discounts, different things like that. Um, it's that's and that'll be a really powerful lever because people like people. We've talked about testimonials already. It does lead to more sales. It's just it's a good world for um for brands to go to to help their customers sell on their behalf so that would be another area I'd see and you think going. We, you know we did it we did an episode a couple of months ago about conversational commerce um mm. and do you think chatbots inevitably will also play a role they do feature in it and that's the thing it's kind of a lot of the questions that people ask uh, brands on social media are what's the size what's the delivery time all that stuff People use social channels to communicate with brands because it's easy. Yes, they will have that postal address where you can send them a letter or a phone number and be on hold for two hours, but it's much easier to tweet at someone or send a DM on Instagram or something. You can. There's a lot of integrations, a lot of tools that will manage those conversations for you, either in a customer service way, leading to a better customer experience and then hopefully better sales, but also to funnel people who ask kind of sales based questions into kind of discovering the right product for them. So they'll ask, they'll have automated responses like what size are you looking for? Is it a gift? What color? You know, what's your price range? And they will, the bot will then scan the inventory and present the customer with a bunch of different options that they can go ahead and buy. And it's kind of like it's like talking to that sales assist- assistant in a store who will bring you to over to the rack and show you, you know, the best Nespresso kind of um, flavors for you or whatever it is. You know, they will guide you. Um, We typically know what people are looking for. And all we have to do is set the conditions in a chatbot to guide them through the purchase process. And um, if it's not completed, how can we recover it? So it does a lot of man, it does a lot of heavy lifting for you. It takes a lot of, hours away from people having to actually manually deal with dms so chatbots are getting there but i think people fear them at the moment because it looks like that looks hard but 
to be honest, it mightn't be as hard as well, you Well, that's think. great. So thanks so much for telling us all about that, Cahill. It's really interesting. I think what's I think what's so compelling about it is that as with all social media tools, it's such a leveler. You know, uh, huge brands like, you know, PepsiCo and Levi Jeans and Nike, they've got the access to exactly the same tools as we have, you know, and people running businesses from home selling handcrafted goods. And it's all there to be used um, to reach the exact people who want your products, regardless of where they are in the world. Um, and uh, I'm sure that, that can only be a good thing, right? Definitely. I mean, the thing is, we just need a mindset shift that social media is not just this brand channel. It's an actual commercial channel and a very good commercial channel because it's just so easy. It's the one click buy and it. It really does yeah, work. Yeah, it is. It's. I think that's the thing. It's the reason it's so so great and and moving at such a pace is because it's all about the user. It's all about the audience. It's just making things easier for them. Um, and uh, anything that is you know truly user centric is a good thing. I think. Well, thanks a lot, Cahill. That's great. Lots of insight there. Lots of lots to think about. And um, yeah, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. One last question: Where can our listeners find you online? Oh, uh, I, I'm all over the internet. You know, LinkedIn, that's where to find me. That's my social commerce, social space that I'm very... And Cahill with. Malin, it, Cahill is an Irish name, isn't it? R- remind us of the spelling so people can find you. Oh, yeah. So Cahill is C-A-T-H-A-L. It was the ninth most unpopular name for newborn babies in Ireland <laughs> a few years back. So... um Certainly a name in decline and a certain tongue twister for a lot of, of non-Gaelic speakers. But um, but yeah, that's where <laughs> to find me. That's you. That's me. Cool. We'll, we'll, we, will, we will indeed. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thanks, Will. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information about transforming your marketing career through certified online training, head to digitalmarketinginstitute.com. Thanks for listening.